what we accomplished out there today. Ain't none of y'all believe that. Maybe a couple of y'all that knew me and know how I get down. They know I, I'm a winner. We're going to end up winning. Ain't none of y'all thought you was going to be sitting up here. You, you supposed to be on the other side. You know, interviewing that or coming and asking me, well, what happened? You said this and you said that. Yeah. Now what? Now what? Everybody quiet now. Now what? Welcome into a new Buff Stampede radio. Adam Munster Tiger, the publisher of BuffStampede.com. Joined by football analyst William Gardner, the only one that truly believed because William had Colorado winning their season opener over TCU. Of course, the Buffs do pull, pull off the big upset. William, I picked a 38-31 loss for Colorado on the road. How big is the uh, serving of crow that, that I must now ingest? I, I don't think – I mean, you know, I, I think eating crow is more reserved for people to talk tr talk trash and set things to – you know, I mean, I don't think you ever expressed any real serious doubts. I think you thought things were going to go well, but I, you know, I think people who can't understand, um, I don't know what the word I'm looking for, a uh, certain amount of skepticism from CU fans at this point, or anybody following this program for the last five or 10 years, you know, well, that's their problem. Uh, I, you know, I think I said on the board on fr sometime Friday, late Friday, um, I was nervous as hell. I was like, you know, I know what my head is telling me, but my last five, six years of CU, well, let's go back 10 years. I mean, you know, let's go back to the last 10, 15 years of being a CU follower. You know, it was really difficult for me to believe what I could see with my own eyes and not feel like, well, you know, something bad is going to happen because we're the Colorado Buffaloes and, and, you know, in my head, I was having little visions of, oh, my God, what if we get blown out? What if, what if all the people talking about the lines are true and whatever? So it's understandable, I think. Um, but I I, I, I feel like, um, you know, I always try to look at everything as objectively as I can. I don't think I can be truly objective. But um, just look at looking at uh, the things I knew about this team, the things I knew about that team, I'm not surprised by the results. I think I might have. I think I picked a bigger winning spread for us, like ten points, but pretty. I think it was pretty close. I think it was in the forties and the some forty to forty-one to thirty-one or something like that, maybe. So okay, a side dish of crow. I'll, I'll take that. Yeah, uh, yeah like a did, small, like an appetizer. Okay. Yeah. Tom Tom Luganbill, who said that Colorado might have the worst roster in college football. Uh, I don't even know if Joey Chestnut could eat that that much crow well and that's just stupid and lazy i mean you know to, to make a comment like that for okay it's 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 hyperbole to begin with okay it, it you don't know what all the other rosters in a college football look like you're just right off the top of your head because of what happened last year saying cu's no good and this thing with uh deon sanders that won't work okay if you don't think it'll work great good for you but at least come up with a, a legitimate reason and don't say something completely off the ball stupid like worst uh roster in, in college football when you don't even know what the roster is so yeah uh i mean to me you know people get upset about that kind of thing but to me that's just that's just too stupid and lazy to even i i can't even get worked up about that you know it's like a three-year-old saying i want ice cream you know i don't know I don't think the guy's much of a journalist and I, w I wouldn't listen to anything he has to say for the rest of his life ever based on that one comment, because he's clearly got no credibility. So Mr. 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 Luganbill, I ain't reading your crap, put it up there and you'll get your clicks from, from idiots that don't want to do their homework either. But uh, you're a sorry, some bitch. Bill Winter. All right. Thank you. Today's episode is brought to us by Macaulay Capital Fractional CFO Services. Is your business looking for financial guidance and support, but not yet big enough to hire a full-time CFO? Well, we have a solution for you. Hiring a fractional CFO who can work with your business on a part-time basis. You get the benefit of having a seasoned financial expert on your team without the commitment or expense of a full-time hire. And here's the best part. It's likely that a partnership with Macaulay Capital will be a win-win situation, meaning that your business will make more money from the guidance of a fractional CFO 
than the total cost of partnering with us. For more information or to set up a meeting, please visit MacaulayCapital.com. That's M-C-C-A-U-L-E-Y Capital.com. Before we really dive into this football game, William, I want to give a quick hat tip to Maurice Sims and his strength and conditioning staff. That looked like a real top-level football team out there from a a size and conditioning standpoint. I was really impressed, and that was really, really hot out there on Saturday. Yeah, and I was going to ask, I got some questions for you about what it was actually like there, you know, the atmosphere and the temperatures and whatever, but it, it it was incredible to me. We got stronger. I'm watching that game. We we got it. I swear to God, we got stronger as the game went on, and they were the ones having cramps, and they lived there, which I thought was interesting, you know. And so, so and not only not only uh, Coach Mo and his staff, but you know, it comes from the top. You know, you know a, a strength and conditioning coach can only go as far as the head coach will let him go, you know. And uh, uh, you know, you think about last week, early I think in the week, Coach Prime stopped him, said, "We're going to run 700, seven hundred, seven right now." And then we're going to go back to practice to see how you respond to adversity. And it's those kinds of things that uh, paid off on Saturday um, with, with uh, you know, I, I, I'm not aware of anybody on our sideline that had any cramping problems. Or Just or Derek McClendon once, but that's the only one that I noticed. Okay. Yeah. You know, and, uh, so our guys just got stronger and there at the end when we when we needed on an offense, we got it. When we needed it on defense, we got it. And everybody was just uh, stronger at the end almost than they were at the start. So huge, huge shout out. I mean, I know every year this year has been different because we had videos all the time, but every year it's like, oh, you know, best lifting summer ever, blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. But I think everybody can see it this time around. Yeah. I said after the game on Saturday that it feels like we're living in a movie. And then the next day I'm boarding my flight back from Dallas and the flight is just packed with CU fans and everybody's giving fist bumps and, and, you know, screaming loudly. Even the the flight attendants took notice of Colorado's victory and and gave a shout out to to all the bus fans there. So it's just so different than the road trips that I'm used to covering with Colorado, even from the media standpoint, just how many people were crammed into this tiny little side of, of, of an area to, to just see coach prime and his comments after the game. It's crazy. And then, and then I, I'm watching the replay when I get back, William, and that's exactly what coach prime is kind of intimating the, to Aaron Andrews that they're, they're going to make a mo- movie about us and they are obviously yeah. doing a documentary, yeah. but uh, it, it really is just uh, you got to pinch yourself a little bit. Yeah, and, and I was going to say somebody, I, I I couldn't remember which interview it was, but I get it was Aaron Andrews and she, you know, something about, I don't know, there was some comment about this is, or I don't mean, one of, maybe it was Michael Irvin too, or he's like, there, that's your Rudy out there. And then something like, there was a comment like that about, they're going to make a movie out of this and uh, it, it's going to be unbelievable, you know, and I think he alluded to something like that. And I, and I guess since you brought it up, that's one of the things I wanted to ask you Uh I know, you know, people want to hear more from you, but uh, I want to know what it's like in that post-game presser and what did the – I think we all want to know when Coach Prime called out that reporter, what was the what was the feeling in the room? What was, the, was there tension? Is that, Was it different than anything you'd ever seen? As a, as a, had you ever seen a coach do that? Most coaches can't get away with that, you know, but <laughs> yeah. Coach Prime can, and yeah. he does, and Tell he will. Tell about that he, a little bit. Yeah. I I know that Coach Prime is using this platform to get a message out. And Ed Werder, I guess, had a tweet out that he deleted that maybe talked about uh, Coach Prime being a celebrity coach. And uh, I would imagine that Coach Prime took offense to that because it intimates that he's not a real football coach. And so I get why he would be annoyed at him. Um but some of the other stuff that he goes back with reporters, I don't think he's going at the reporter themselves. He's just trying to make a point. And uh, it works because it gets on ESPN, you know, 15 minutes after the press conference ends. So it, it makes a total sense. Uh, I'm sure I'm going to ask a stupid question and, and have to suffer the consequences of that at some point. So far, I'm doing OK in that regard. Uh, I, I think you got to think your questions through a little bit, too, right? Some of these questions are just not well thought out. 
Right. That's what I was going to say is like, you're not going to get in trouble because you, you put some thought and some preparation into, into what you do. And you, you have a sense of professionalism that, for example, a Logan bill doesn't have, you know, where, you know, I'm not going to just spout off about something I don't know about. So I, I think you're probably going to be in a lot better position. I've never seen that many national writers at a CU game. And that includes going to the Pac-12 championship game in 2016. So that it, and if, if, to the extent that you're able to talk about this, what, how does that, what's the, how do you sort of ride that line as a journalist? Uh, I can't really, I got to be careful, can't piss off this this coach or this staff, but I also have a responsibility to tell the truth and, and tell the whole story. It's easier, I think, with coaches like Tad Boyle and Coach Prime, where they will address issues that they have, like Coach Prime mentioned the special teams woe so you don't have to press a coach on some of those topics because they're willing to address them themselves does that make sense so yeah, sure. it's not really yeah. that challenging because coach prime is going to tell how it is he's not going to sugarcoat things right so you don't have to put you don't have to dig and, and try to find things out and, with, and I, I would imagine that along those same lines all the video access that we all get sort of sort of answers some of the questions that sure come. But have, have you ever seen, I mean, I guess you sort of, sort of, sort of answered it. Have you ever seen anything like this covering football? Any, at, I mean, and by this, I mean, the whole damn thing, man, you know, from, from no. when he was hired until now, and especially this last weekend. When it looks like coach prime was legitimately leaning towards taking this job in November you start to think, okay, what would that look like? And from a media standpoint, one of the first thoughts I had, and I actually shared this with Mark Johnson, was that he's going to keep us on our toes as reporters, for sure. Um, I expected it to be about 75% of what it's been in terms of the excitement. Because I just I knew that the world would all of a sudden turn their attention to Boulder, Colorado, and that he would attract top-level recruits and transfers. But just a little extra, just a little bit more than I could have anticipated him coming out at the press luncheon and, and dancing with Peggy and just all of what he brings to the table uh, as a head coach and really an ambassador for Boulder, Colorado right now. You know, he's kind of kind of the, the king of the town. And I've been impressed with uh, just his ability to embrace Colorado so quickly. But I, I think I think a lot of people misunderstand him. I think they have ever since way back in the in the eight early eighties when he was a player, you know. And I think, well, he's this big, I don't know, uh, prima donna or whatever. You know, he he's seeking the hot, the spotlight, whatever. It, he he's just a phenomenally joyful human being, is what I get. You know that he that, that this he's always thinking of things, and and when he reaches out to to Peggy and everybody else, it's just gen part of it is just really genuine, you mm -hmm. know, that you've been a fan. Like, like, like when he, I, I remember that video when he walked around the facilities for the first time and he was just in awe, you know, and, and that first interview um, with the team that's gotten so much press over the months and they focused on one aspect, but they missed entirely when he said, all these good people have been fans of this team deserve better than what they've got. That's what I heard yeah. from that interview. As a guy who's been part of this program for 40 years, that's what I heard is a guy who finally, finally got a guy in here who gives a damn about me and all the rest of us to show up and pay for the damn thing. It's really cool. Just the, the pride that folks have. My wife was down there in Fort Worth taking photos and I was going through a lot of the crowd shots she took and in there is Marquez Harad with his big Colorado flag. And it's like, I, I haven't seen Marquez around in a minute. It's been a while since he's been, you know, getting on a plane to go watch a Colorado game. And you looked uh, kind of around the field after the game. There are just a lot of faces that we haven't seen. And just to see the, the pride that they once again have in CU is pretty awesome. Yeah, tell us more about that. I mean, tell us about the heat. Tell us about was it loud in there? Just Kind of just tell us about being at the game for all of us that weren't there. Yeah, well, for me, I was covering it from the press box, and some press boxes have kind of a, an open feel to it where you can get the feel of the atmosphere in the crowd. 
this one was pretty much shut. Even when they sang the national anthem, you could barely hear that it was taking place. The flyover was not all that loud in the press box. So we're kind of removed from, from it a little bit in that sense. The internet didn't work until I think five oh, or 10 minutes into the game. So there was a lot of media that were pretty frustrated. I was able to create a little bit of a hotspot for my phone to get a few things done, but it was pretty frustrating because I was getting stuff multimedia video photos from my wife from the field and I wasn't able to get those up online so it was kind of annoying so uh that was the big commotion until the game really got going and, and what an entertaining game uh what about, I, what, what about what about like I assume you got in the night before what about walking around town and what was the atmosphere before and then how did it change after I actually flew out on Thursday okay because Brett Yormark, the Big 12 commissioner, hosted a press conference on Friday, so got in early for that. Uh, and there weren't a lot of CU fans flying out Thursday morning because, obviously, uh, most of the traffic coming in for the game was on Friday. But Gary Barnett was on my plane. He went out early to to get some golf in, so it was, it was good to see him. And then uh, we had some time to kill, so I actually went and got barbecue, uh, hard eight barbecue. It was pretty solid. I'd give it like a seven and a half or an, yeah. or an eight. It was pretty solid. Uh, better than you know most of the stuff you can get here in Colorado, uh, and then we had more time to kill. So we actually went to the JFK Memorial and walked around the museum there. The museum's yeah. actually the f- fifth floor of the book depository where. Right. So that, that was yeah, that it, was it, it, that was cool. It's ama- it's, that's an amazing that's an amazing place for it, the history fans, if you like that. And Definitely. speaking of which, we got GQ last night, and that was pretty damn good. Yeah, it is. So, yep. Yeah. And GQ is at Folsom Field, so uh, that's one yeah. of the, the food spots uh, to go to this coming Saturday. Uh, but Brett Yormark, you can see why he was able to to pull off that TV deal. Very savvy, uh, was really impressed with him. George Klyovkov kind of has this like big bird persona. He's really tall and just a, a tiny bit goofy, whereas Brett Yormark, I mean, this is a guy that, that worked for Jay-Z, so he's very yeah. polished and, and yeah, right. very confident and can speak really well. So I was impressed with that. There wasn't a whole lot to take away from that, but it was fun to kind of start to think about what it's going to look like a year from now when Colorado is in the big 12. Um, so that was kind of beforehand. We walked around the Fox studio. They were setting up for big noon kickoff and the pregame show it, there and everything. Is, is TCU a thing in Fort Worth, Dallas area? Are they, you know, is, is it a big deal? Or and not like the Cowboys, obviously, but yeah, I mean, they had a record crowd there. And when we were trying to get our media credentials from Will Call, I mean, there were folks buying standing only tickets. So there's quite a bit of buzz around there. The area around TCU, the campus is beautiful. It's gorgeous. Dallas in general is not a whole lot to, to yeah. look at. Uh, it's right. just unless you love just freeways and overpasses, right. that's right. most it's, of what you yeah. see. Uh, but no, it was, it, w- it was a nice area. It's a nice stadium. Um, and so the, the atmosphere was good. My wife said that the fans were just relentless and really nasty. The last game she had photographed before this was at Minnesota last year. So those are like the nicest people on the planet. And also right. how much trash are you going to talk as Minnesota fans when you're just destroying Colorado? So, yeah. uh, yeah. but what, what, know, what, that, tell me, what, what, what did she say, like, does that during the game or when you're at will call? or Pre-game, right? during the game, not, yeah, at the, directed at the players. It, it was pretty rough. It, they're going to have that everywhere they go this year because uh, no program in the country has more of a spotlight than Colorado right now. So they're just going to be a magnet to that. They're, I'd imagine, you know, got thick enough skin in, you know, they know what they signed up for, these guys. Right. Well, they don't probably don't care. I mean, you know, I don't, most teams probably don't, you know, I've been on the fans. I've been on the sidelines to see you many a time and hurt things, you know, well, as, an, as, a, as a coach, too. This hurt things from high school parents that you're like, wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, was there any difference after the game? Did you, to, I mean, you probably missed all the crowd because you're. They, they got out of there pretty quick. And yeah, but I mean, it was <laughs> right two hours after kickoff before I walked back to my car and yeah, it was pretty dead at that point. We got some Whataburger after that. So yeah, no, it was Dallas isn't my favorite city, uh, but it was uh, and it, the, the weather doesn't help this time of year. Cause it's just, well, so let me ask you one more question in my reporter role, and All right. like a little football, but um, compare this road trip to any other road trip you've done following CU football. Tell us what, ha- tell us where does it, how does it fit in? 
Oregon in 2016 is the one that would be kind of similar. Just pure joy on everybody's face from the equipment staff to the players, the coaches, the fans walking around the airport, flying back and just seeing uh, pure excitement over what's happening. That's the last time I've seen that for, from this fan base on a road trip. What about you personally? It's you got to withhold a lot of the emotions right in this gig. So it's strange, but um, at the end of the day, there's nobody on this planet that wants this program to have success more than I do. So uh, I don't show it outwardly, but in there, yeah, no, it's, it's pretty awesome to go from last year in just the depression that was covering this football program. Um, you could see it on Brian and I's faces when we were covering those road games, it was miserable. Uh, it really was. What, that was, that was tough. Let me dig at that just for a second is t- tell us what does this mean for you? And I, by this, I mean the whole thing. What does this mean for you professionally in your role? And and you've alluded to part of it that it's a lot more fun to do it, but that, does it make your job bigger? Does, you know, I don't know. Do you make more money out of it? Is it is where does it go from here for you? It's just a lot busier. It, it def, obviously, subscriptions are up, ad revenues up, so it's good from that standpoint. Whereas, you know, it's tough. You know, it's hard to blame folks for not wanting to uh, subscribe to a Colorado site that focuses on recruiting when you're, you know, not getting blue chip recruits and you're not winning football games. And so I uh, thank everybody that hung in there with us on buffstampede.com during those lean years. Cause it allowed me to keep doing this as a living, but no, this is, this is huge from that standpoint. Now I've never worked harder in my life. You know, after the game, I had to find a spot to go do a, a TV spot with CBS sports HQ and you know, there's radio stations that are wanting you on right away, but then you've got your regular work you got to get done. So balancing all of it is is a challenge because this is new. You know, this is I started covering Colorado kind of in, in 2003 when kind of, kind of on the downturn of things and went through the Hawkins era, Embry era in outside of 2016. They're just what Colorado just wasn't in the national spotlight at all. Yeah. So uh, it's yeah. different. It's fun. It's also exhausting at times. Do you have a percentage feel for how big, how much the, the website has grown in terms of subscribers and such? Yeah, it's been, it's been pretty beneficial. Yeah. I don't know if I'm supposed to put exact numbers oh, okay. out there, but fair, fair enough. it's, let me ask you a different question. And have you been able to watch any of the game on TV yet? Yeah, I rewatch it. And that's what I want to do with you is kind of go through some of the, the notes okay. that I jotted but, down. Cause it is, do. that's one, that's one other thing, William, is that covering the game sometimes it's hard to get everything down because yeah, you're watching sure. the live action. And usually with Colorado football, you'd look up because the TV broadcast is delayed a little bit and watch the play again on the TV. If you've got a, a decent TV in the press box by you with the Sean Lewis offense, you can't do that because the next play is going so quickly. So I needed to rewatch this game more than I've ever needed to rewatch a Colorado game. And before we dive into the football, did you see the commercials? I, I saw like the. About, I feel like we're talking about the Super Bowl because we're talking commercials. So, you're talking about the Aflac commercial, right? And then, and then he also had one for almonds. Yes, I did see that. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, which one did you like better? Uh <laughs> they were both good. Uh but probably the give me the Aflac commercial. Yeah. Yeah, when I, when you say, hey, let me introduce you to one of my new homies. Yeah, I, I I even thought it was funny that uh, Coach Saban said on Alpha would have been scarier. <laughs> <laughs> that was my great. wife asked me, "What does that mean?" I was like, "That's their mascot is uh, Alabama." But uh, anyway, again, okay. but again, it feels like we're living in a movie, right? You're seeing Colorado's right? head coach on an Affleck commercial with with Ralphie making an appearance, right? And and Coach Nick Saban, you know, it's like. People now, you know, equate those two because of that in in certain ways. But it's it's just a lot of fun, and maybe now we could talk a little football. Let's do it. All right. The first the first play that that I want to point out wasn't uh, you know maybe at the top of every highlight package, but Mikey Harrison breaking that tackle early was like okay. We heard yeah. that he's really stepped it up and is going to be you know a plus player for this football team, but. You just have have some reservations there until you see it, and and that was a nice little play he made getting that first down. 
and I think it answers some questions about the tight end position and how it's used in this offense. And, and I think that the success that this offense had in the passing game and, and, and really that's the role of a tight end in an offense like this is, you know, two, three, four times a game, you get that guy and he's the guy because, you know, they're going to put so much emphasis on these receivers, um, you know, that, that every now and then you got to, you got to have that tight end just as a safety valve. And, and, you know, I mean, people have said it on the board is, is, you know, if we don't get that first down, maybe it's a different game. Who knows? I don't know. But so it was a huge play and just a, a showed the kind of effort that this team had. And, and, and I, and I think all the way through the game, right down to that last defensive play, I saw guys just, you know, that, that extra half an inch, that extra little bit of effort, get an extra yard, get, you know, try to try to get a hand on a guy and whatever that I didn't see that from TCU and, 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 you know, I know I'm not the, not the beat up former buff, but Mark Perry didn't make much of an effort on that long pass to, uh, 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 Dylan Edwards, you know, and I, and, and I, I just don't think that our guys w- would have let that go, but, um, that sort of sense of effort, I think also goes back to what we saw from coach Mo all summer long about, you know, get that extra be first in your, in your competition and compete with everything. So that, that was an exciting play. To me. Yeah, Anthony Hankerson had one of those extra effort first down runs early in the game, too, that w- was pretty similar kind of to, to show that extra effort. Now, Hankerson was one of the few guys on this team that was doing that last year, too, um, and that's yeah. why he's still here. Um, yeah, and the, the tempo really stands out again. Uh, yeah. I had to change the way I was watching the game from the press box from the way I normally did. And TCU was going crazy tempo too. Uh, it was kind of like you ever listen to a podcast, like at one and a half speeds or an audio book at one yeah, and a half speeds. Yeah. It looked like a, a football game that was going faster than, than what you're used to. But you know, what was interesting to me is later on in the game and they even commented about this on the TV broadcast was Lewis slowed it down and he matched his tempo to what we needed at that, at that time. And he slowed it down a little bit, took a little bit more time. And the, the commentators even said, I wonder if he's going slow so they get the last score or don't have to go on defense. But um, it was interesting. And the offense still worked. It didn't have to be at that super high tempo. And what you really, what really gets you going is go, Oh my God, what about when we go at that tempo in Boulder and teams can't get any oxygen? Yeah. It TCU is a team that because they go up tempo, their defense is used to that tempo. So, uh, yeah, what happens when you get a team at altitude that isn't ready for that pace? It's going to be uh, I think Colorado is going to uh, turn some of these games into into track meets. Yeah. Like, you know, for example, if a team played a very slow game on Thursday last week and now they got to come and run a track meet, maybe that plays against them a little bit. If you sort of see what I'm saying there. The defense obviously had its issues, uh, but they make the big play late, and we'll get to that later when they needed to. In Trevor Woods with that interception in the end zone when TCU was uh, driving with ease was a big tone setter, too, in this football game early on. Yeah, and I think – well, I think that very first drive when they – I mean, it it stands out to me for some reason that the first drive of the game was three and out, and the last drive of the game was a four and out. And that the, at the, they bookended the game with those really big um, series where they where they shut them down completely. And I, you know, I know you know some people talk about like these interceptions as they're oh you know what well you're not going to get a gift like that. It's not a gift. You know, I, it was interesting to listen to uh, Travis Hunter in uh, in his post game presser talk about they they showed us this. The coaches showed us this play, and we went over it in practice. And our offense ran it. And we knew what they were going to do. And so when, when they lined up in that formation, as soon as those guys started going inside, I knew that he was going to throw outside and I started going that direction. So, you know, it, it wasn't just his superior athleticism, although I don't know that too many other corners could have made that even known it was coming. Uh, yeah. But he, he had been coached and prepared to look for that play. You know, I've been saying for years, coaching matters and the X's and O's are important when you got a coach's staff that knows what the heck they're doing. And I think you re- we really saw that this particular weekend. And I, I thought that, um, you know, a lot, people have talked a lot about the run game, but I don't think, you know, that, that Lewis felt like he needed to establish the run game. And because the passing game was so effective, why would you change that up? Yeah. So, I, I, you know, are there, are, are there potentially issues with the run? I don't know. And I, I don't, I don't think that what that one game is enough of a sample to say one way or the other. Um, 
but I think they're going to try to emphasize that more as we go through the season. Trevor Woods had a forced fumble too early in the second quarter. Uh, a play, the touchdown run that TCU had early in the second quarter, clearly Kyrie Manns got held on that play. I actually just tweeted out before we hit record here some pictures from my wife that, I mean, they've got a handful of his jersey and are pulling back on that. So that was one of the missed calls in that game. Let's talk about Bishop Thomas here for a second, because <laughs> that to me was my favorite play. And I think it was the favorite play for a lot of Colorado fans on Saturday. Yeah, I love I there, there was a time as a kid that Merrill Hodge, the old fullback, was my favorite player in the NFL. I just yeah. love when fullbacks get in there and wreck lives. And that's exactly what Bishop Thomas did, did on that Savion Wilkerson touchdown run. Did you see the video from the walkthrough and the, and the running yesterday practice where they, where, where, they, where Bishop was on there and, they, and the, some of the guys gave him a hard time about that play? And and he says, yeah, I looked up there and I was like, that bitch is a big dude. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he's just so funny, man, you know, and, and yeah. he destroyed that guy and, and they kept showing it, you know, from different directions and slowed down. And, and, and it was just really the most, I, I, I'm not sure I've ever seen a block quite like it. I've seen running backs run over guys as running backs before, but I'm not sure I've ever seen that kind of kind of explosive, just blow somebody up in the hole. Yeah. I mean, and I, you know, I said, you know, somebody, somebody starts talking about it. Mark Perry kind of stepped away and I was like, do you blame the guy? I mean, he just saw a car wreck. I'm not going to jump in front of that. <laughs> well, it's funny from the TV angle, the main TV angle, it looks like the TCU defender just like disappears into earth because Bishop Thomas knocks him back and then falls on him. And then there's some other bodies in that area. Like you can't yeah. see the TCU defender anymore. He just yeah. ceases he just, to just, exist. Just, Right, he just he just blown away back three four yards, and when you see it from the other direction in slow motion, you sort of see why because he he really goes back three or four yeah. yards and falls down, and and you know, I you know that that's the kind of play that in films, you know, if you win that game in your TCU, you get a lot of good natured ribbing, and everybody gives you a hard time. They're not going to have a lot of fun with that play this in, in this situation, but we sure are. And oh, yeah. you know, I, I think the the the, 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 the I'm going to put it this way: the legend of Bishop grows. It certainly does. Uh, the next time he's out there, I'm focusing in on him. Yeah, well, that's that. what he, he he even said yesterday. He, he said, "I'm going to get a touchdown. I'm going to get a touchdown this year." <laughs> <laughs> there were no CU punts through the first 25 minutes of this football game. That's yeah, that was crazy. I, I, there was only one, wasn't there? It, was there two? Uh, in, in the first half or the whole game? The whole game. Whole game. Let me look it up. Because oh, the only one I remember was that amazing one that bounced out at the half yard line. And I said to my no, wife, "No, said, there were there were there were three punts there, in the okay. game." Yeah. I said to my wife after that, I said he couldn't do that if he tried. And she said, "Well, he was trying, and that's what he did." I was like, "Good point. <laughs> that's <laughs> a, you're right. He was trying, and that's what he did." So you know. That's um, the pinnacle for a punter. It doesn't yeah. get any better than that. And that's got to be such a weird dynamic. You're this person on a, on a football team that really is only used when things go wrong, right? right. And <laughs> you can't have a moment better than that. What was it at the – not even the half-yard line. I mean, that yeah. was so close to the pylon. Right. And, and I loved that the ref was standing right over there. I mean, it was like – I said, well, there's no question about the call. It's in front of him. Yeah. So that, that was another one of those two, you know, people were talking about unsung heroes, man, that punt, you know, it, that was crazy. And, 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 and it flipped the whole field, made a huge difference and, and they had to go a long direction. And, you know, I, I've heard coaches say, you know, the, the longer they got to go, the more chances there are for a mistake. And sure enough, that's how it ended up. Cause that's the one where that's the, that's the drive where Travis got his pick, right? Is that the drive? Um, I think it might've, yeah. Cause I think it was like 99 yards and then it, I don't know. And uh, no, all no, that, yeah. I want to ask you though. Okay. So you mentioned the Travis Hunter interception and how he read that play. And I also want to throw in that first Dylan Edwards screen pass touchdown in the second half. When I went back and rewatched those a bunch of times, I was thinking how many players in college football would have been able to make those plays with Dylan Edwards just having the sense to know when to stop and start, 
how to where where to set up his blocks and when to brush a guy's arm hand off when he's trying to you know get contact on you and then just hit the acceleration and Travis Hunter I mean that yeah. looked like a touchdown when the ball was thrown well and then, my, go ahead sorry I, I just don't think there's a lot of players uh, at the running back position and at the cornerback position in the country that that would be able to make either of those plays. Well, on that last pass play where off to the left flat and he just flat out ran at a linebacker, my wife even pointed out that, that the way he made Mark Perry miss was that he slowed down. And then that, then he just hit the gas. And she's like and, – and she was watching. She's like, did you see his stride get much longer all of a sudden? And I was like, yeah, that's him hitting the gas because he suckered him in by slowing down. And he didn't – you know, it's not something he thinks about. It's just – instinctively, yeah. you know, I don't know, it's kind of like pray and pray, you know, like I got to make the lion miss me. Right. So, you know, like, and then he's gone. The, the change of the change of speed and the acceleration was crazy. So yeah, those, those little things. I mean, when we talk about talent, look, we've had fast guys on the team in the last 10 years, but they don't have that little extra thing, you know, how they, how they perceive the, you know, part, part of that is you're looking out at the field, right. And in your brain is doing all this complex mathematics, quite frankly. It's like, how fast is that guy coming? What angle is he coming at? How do I not meet him at that spot and whatever? And, and you know, I read an interesting article one time talking about, uh, like, like in really good inside linebackers, um, a lot of them tend to have ADD issues because they process things differently. And they process a lot of information very quickly and make decisions, right? And so one of the things people talk, people think that great athletes – it's all about the athleticism and how fast you are and how fast you jump. But a lot of it is that their brain does different things than everybody else and they see things faster. And so those, those kinds of things, you know, to, to, for Travis Hunter to make that interception is a combination of so many different things that everybody else just doesn't have. Yeah. I, I got to admit, I'm a little jealous. It's gotta be fun to have, those instincts and that athleticism, yeah. right? As uh, well, I, I grew up playing basketball and I was more of a three-point shooter, I could give you some hustle points, but man, I just right, didn't have right. the athleticism. And it would be nice for just one day to, to know what that feels like. Even when you watch Travis Hunter fall, yeah. he does it so gracefully. It's like right. a thing of beauty, the way he pops back up. Well, then, you know, think about it, to go in a totally different direction. Think about standing at a plate in a major league, major league baseball game and a guy throws a hundred mile an hour fastball. You can't see that ball. You 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 make you see the end of his hand as it's coming out, and you make those calculations and react. And how many guys can do that? Almost nobody, right? And, and yeah. it, it's magical to me that they can do. Shadur Sanders, how how the heck does he know when he when how does he move his arm in such a way that when he throws it sixty yards down the field, it drops right into the bucket where he wants it? Yeah. I don't know how to do that. I can't even throw it that far. I, I couldn't shoot it that far out of a cannon. But he not only can throw it that far, but can drop it right in where those guys can do it. How do they do those? Things? I I have never understood that kind of stuff, um, you know. And I can I can talk more about it with linemen and you know how they can do it with their hands or whatever. But some of those things are just sort of magical to me, and, and it's hard yeah. to say. Which uh, also what I want to point out though is when you look at some of those runs, and I think some people on the board have seen this, like that first screen pass to Dylan. Jack Bailey got downfield, man. He I mean he got downfield as fast as a lineman could get down there and made a key block. And then later on in the game, Shadur was rolling to his left and was under pressure from a guy coming up. And I remember seeing Jack Bailey just chugging as, as hard as an offensive lineman could go to get out there and throw his body out there and just move that guy, you know, a half a foot enough for, for Shadur to escape. And those are the things that come from a well-coached team that's playing for each other that don't make the, 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 the box scores or the highlights, but those are the little things that make teams win or not win. And that's what you see with this team. You know, like, you didn't ask me this, but I, I had to tell you the, the offensive lineman I was most impressed with Saturday was Jack Bailey because he was technically sound and he was tough and mean, and he just had hustle like nobody's business. He doesn't have the talent or the size that some of those other guys have, but he just gives everything he has. And it wouldn't surprise me if he keeps on playing. Yeah, Roderick Ward was another big effort play right. in that game, chasing right. down the kickoff return. They did end up scoring there, but uh, again, well, that, just another example. And and I, and you know, everybody talks about everything else Travis Hunter did. Travis Hunter saved that game, 
when he ran down that run, uh, that long run that they had, and, and he and he and Roderick Ward, I think, no, it was him and I don't know who the other one was, but no, I think it was him and and maybe uh, 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 Sanders that that he ran that down. Now people talk about cornerbacks as not being run support guys and prima donnas, and and he's the hit star of the game. And on that play, he just used every ounce of speed he had to catch that guy and stop that play so it didn't turn into a touchdown. And then we got the turnover. Um, and, and you know, you look at there's so many of those plays that without that play, we don't win. And that happened all throughout the game. During the preseason, I got into a debate on a serious XM channel. And I forget the host name. He was uh, he played as an offensive lineman in the NFL for a while. And he was saying that it was irresponsible what Colorado was planning to do with Travis Hunter in terms of him being pretty much a full time starter both ways. Now, he had a few breaks offensively, but not many. And my point to him then was, if you say that about ninety nine point nine percent of athletes, you're probably right with Travis Hunter. It's the point one percent. He's just a unicorn right. in that sense. He's right. still dancing in the locker room after the game. Uh, I would have need. 10 IVs right. plugged into me, right. uh, maybe midway through the first quarter uh, with, with the amount of running that he was doing out in that heat. Uh, can, uh, this leads me to a question I want to pose to you, though. Is this sustainable to this level throughout the entire season? Well, who knows? We don't know. We haven't seen the guy do this before because everybody talked about they hadn't seen that uh, happen in the game. I don't think we'll have days, you know, with that kind of heat and humidity again, probably at all this year, but you know, some guys are just different and I, and I'll, and I'll make another sports analogy. People climb Mount Everest, right. And some people got oxygen and they can't get up the damn thing. And then a guy like Ed Vesters has gone up the thing 10 times without oxygen and his body just processes oxygen differently than everybody else. He can suck it out of the air and, and make it work. Right. Well, um, Travis Hunter is, is just like that. His body, processes all this energy usage in a different way his his muscles clear out all that that uh you know uh waste product and everything else and, and he just is able to keep on going and i don't think it's irresponsible because i'm very sure that the training staff and the coaching staff was keeping an eye on him to make sure that he was doing all right but like you know people keep asking prime that and he keeps like that's him he's him <laughs> And, and I'm going to answer my own question and say that I think it is sustainable also because yeah. I don't think he's going to practice much this fall. Right. And I right. don't think he's going to need to. Right. Uh, you're going to be able to give him breaks during the week. It's almost like he's going to be this marathon runner on Saturdays. And it's going to, you're going to need him to be in all the walkthroughs, obviously all the film sessions and, and meetings. And so the mental side is there. But right. I don't think Travis Hunter is a guy that needs to really practice during the season. That helps. And that helps you in another way so that other guys get more practice reps to help them develop because they do need it. So it, it's kind of an a, a extra payoff there. And I think that's probably how you do it as well. So uh, I, I, I agree with you. I think it's sustainable. And, and you know, I, I just think he's a totally unique, different kind of a player. Um, and, and I think that'll keep on going. And, you know, I don't know why that makes me think of it. And I don't want to change directions entirely, but, but, there's a lot of room for improvement on this team. There's a lot of room and we are going to get better, which is the exciting thing to me is what we saw on Saturday. That ain't close to what this team can be. And I think we'll see it. You know, the old adage is that, you know, you make your most improvement between game one and game two. Well, that's, if that's true, you know, then what we see on Saturday ought to be pretty exciting. And, and this, this team is just going to get better and better. And they have the coaches and, and the players, quite frankly, to do that. It's fourth and two, under five minutes left in the game. Colorado's at midfield. How nervous are you in, in that moment? Colorado's trailing at this point, obviously. When, when, when we've got the ball? Yep. I, you know what? I, I, I honestly believed in the offense. I was, I, I was actually much more nervous when, there's, when, when, when they got the ball back. You know, could we shut them down and would they just use the clock up and score with three seconds left? You know, I had no doubts about that offense whatsoever. You know, there's just too many weapons, um, and and certainly moving forward, we're gonna we're gonna think that even more so. But um, you know, I, I posted a thing on the board about uh, that play to Dylan, and and they replayed it and they showed what I saw right at the start was the way their defense was set up, and and then they you know here's the difference between a, a good offensive scheme and a bad offensive scheme on that play to Dylan. 
they had the receivers on the, on the left side all did slants across the field to drag the whole secondary out of there, right? And and they and and I, I was talking about this to my wife as as the play developed and right in the aftermath that they they had their middle linebacker covering Dylan Edwards, and she said, "Well, that was stupid." I said, "No, nah, you know, it's a sound schematic decision, but not against that kid, and you won't see that happen again because it, you know how could you know he's that damn fast? You know that he has those abilities." Now you're seeing it. You won't see him covered by a middle linebacker anymore. They're going to have to do something very different on defense. Um, and but then when you do that, then you have to expose something right, else, right? Right, right. Because then you because then now you're going to have to cover him with a defensive back or something else. And where do you get that guy? Who's going to cover Xavier Weaver now? You know, and and so there's just the 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 and and to have and what I call I'm going to go ahead and call him an offensive genius as our offensive coordinator. Instead of, you know, the less than genius folks we've had the last five or six years, uh, we have somebody who's able to take advantage of that now. And so it's very exciting. And, and a quarterback who can get it to whoever, you know. The, <clears throat> my wife kept watching the game. She kept she kept going. She kept talking about Shadur. She's like, he's so calm. He's so calm. He just waits and waits and waits. And then he throws yeah. it to the right guy. And I was like, again, you know, that's a guy – with a different kind, he, he doesn't get rattled back there and he doesn't get phased and he's seeing the field and he's waiting and he knows where everybody's going and he waits for that guy. And then, and then, and then I said, boom, you know, he does have a quick release when he throws, when he gets, when he gets ready to mm -hmm. throw, he, it, it, it's gone. You know, people say he holds on to the ball too long, but it worked out great on Saturday. On that fourth and two play with Dylan Edwards scoring the game winning points, I, Shadur, the timing on that and the accuracy and where he put that ball was perfect. And how about just the poise of Dylan Edwards as a true freshman in that situation? Um, it, I don't know how many guys would be as calm a, as he was in that situation. Yeah, it, it, it was, it was, it was the whole thing. The whole thing was done beautifully. And, and, I, and you know what, quite frankly, I'm going to look at, I'm let's talk about a different play. Let's talk about, I, I don't know what they're calling it. That that it was almost sort of an option play on one of Dylan's touchdowns, they, and and he kind of Shador kind of pitched sort of forty five degrees out to him, mm -hmm. and 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 I that was another one I was talking about with the wife. I was like, they're, they're and I said, see that guy? We we they're showing a replay and the outside linebacker. I said, watch that guy. If he comes to Shadur, he throws the ball. If he goes, if he goes out, if he widens out, then Shadur keeps it. And it was just a beautifully designed play, and they trusted each other. And you know that that's one of those plays in the option. You got to option. You got to run it over and over again to where the running back doesn't have to look at the quarterback. He just knows, and in certain situations, the ball's coming and he gets it. And that play was gorgeous. I mean, it it it, it just it just made them look stupid because we were ready for them. We were we knew what they were going to do on defense. And we had an answer to it every single time. So I think that that and that play is the same same situation you're talking about. Here's a true freshman, you know, you're trusting in that situation to to know what this quarterback is going to do, to know to to understand what the defense is going to do and be ready for that ball to come to him so that he doesn't get pitched to air, you know. So all, all the way through, you can't say enough about Dylan Edwards and his uh, ability to step up at this young spot in his career, and you got to wonder where, the, where where is he going over the next three years? Holy yeah. cow! Right. Run through special teams real quick. Mark Bassett, we mentioned that had a good debut. Uh, Jace Feely, nice field goal, forty nine yarder at the end of the first half, but then had the other one blocked. That's not on Jace Feely. I couldn't. The number didn't have the the person that gave up the block didn't have a name on the back of their jersey have have people done the detective work to figure out i mean i guess we don't need to put them on blast it doesn't matter yeah, but I, I, they, yeah, they, I, they they need they need to shore up some stuff and then the kickoffs yeah. were well, pretty awful that, throughout the game that whole that whole block kick the snap was bad and he had to reach back up here and pull it back down and so the timing was off with feely and and, and so if you they, they showed it on one replay where where um his footwork was off because he was the timing was off and so he kind of kicked it wrong and low and and then the guy got beat to the inside it was it was an inside move and i think they fixed that uh you know they got caught there and, and they fixed that later on we didn't see that on uh extra points or, or field goals after that but what i like is that coach prime called it out in the press conference he said we got to get special teams fixed 
That's not acceptable. We're not going to allow that. We're not going to let that happen. And what I'm very confident of is that, uh, you know, Coach Prime's going to have a talk with somebody face to face. And, and, you know, everybody thinks he's all jovial and happy, but I don't think that's going to be a happy conversation. And I think that person's going to know. But I think even before that conversation, whoever's responsible for those things probably feels a sense of I let the coach down and we're going to and we're not going to let that happen. So uh, I think those things are going to get answered. I think, you know, I coached co co kickoff coverage team everywhere I coached because I wanted to kick off coverage and punt coverage because that to me is about discipline and effort. Everybody covers their lane and they get down full speed and they make it happen. And that's the thing that's easily fixed with good coaching. And I think they'll get that kickoff coverage fixed. Um, but we can't allow special teams to have uh, that much of an impact on a game going forward, or it will be just one of these, one of these weeks. I want to get into a few fan questions. Was there anything else from the game that you wanted to go over? We haven't talked enough about Shadur Sanders. I just don't even know what to say at this yeah, point, you mean, you other than just flat out praising the guy for right. uh, the poise and moxie and accuracy and ba basically being the total package. He missed on a couple throws, but yeah. I mean, the, the body of work was, you're going to take that every day of the week. Right. Well, and, and you know, 500 yards speaks for itself. And did, did he not have any intercept? I think no zero, interceptions right? yeah. zero yeah. with that number of passes thrown and 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 no no hesitancy to take the shot down the field right and when he did he put it on the money for the most part but you know you asked do I have any other football you got a couple hours because we 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 could take this thing down play by play my friend but um you know one thing I want to say is to everybody defensively this is not as big a disaster as you think it is these are little things you know, um, one long run, uh, Devonte or Devonte got got trucked. You know that happens sometimes. Uh, but this is more about. Uh, I know a lot of people are. Oh my, we don't have the, the the size up front. I don't think that's the case. I think we had some breakdowns and people getting their fits. I think we had some people not having their gap responsibility. And I think most of what we struggled with Saturday is fixable. The one thing that was a real true surprise to me was that there was not more of a pass rush but it showed up when we needed it on that last play um and so i was really surprised with the pass rushers that we brought in that we didn't have more of that this week um but i think that's the that's something that they could fix as well uh what was interesting to me was that two guys that, that did get some pressure was was dave harris was a surprise to me a little bit out of all the names and then um uh, Kyrie Manns also showed some good things out there. So I think there's a lot to work with with this defense. Um, and, and, and I don't know what the place counts were with some of the defensive linemen or whatever. But now we have film and now we have the coaching staff that's able to make some adjustments and do some things and do some things differently. And so I think we'll see that get better. And let's face it, Deion Sanders, the whole football career is on defense. He's not going to let that just be what, what this team is defensively. It's going to get better. And should mention it was Jordan Dominic on that that final fourth down play right. that got the pressure right. and a right. really nice play by Miles Slusher to secure that tackle. I mean, um, although Mark Slusher, I gotta I gotta double check that. Uh, even Coach Prime pronounces it Slusher, so I've been yeah. saying it that way. Even the folks that covered him in Arkansas pronounced it that way. Uh, right. Well, where would you why, why, that? Okay, and let's not let's not waste time on that. Go ahead next. <laughs> it just no. chuck, I just I just chuckled about it throughout the whole thing. Well, you kind of uh, led me into what I want to talk about next, and that's a lack of rotation on this team. At the edge, there was a pretty healthy rotation. Uh, running back, there was a healthy rotation. You saw when Travis Hunter needed a breather, Tavares Dawson got some run in there, but. It was the the guys that were first teamers played the offensive line played every snap. Shador Sanders yeah. obviously oh. played every snap. There wasn't Mikey Harrison was the guy they went with at tight end. So there wasn't a ton of rotation, even on the defensive line, where you usually see more of a rotation than yeah. what you saw there on Saturday. So uh we were asked by it's one of the mailbag questions on here. Um, I'll find the name later, but he was asking, is that you know 
uh, a sign of lack of depth or is that, you know, kind of by design? And I, I think it's a little of both. I, I think they just trust that first unit in a lot of positions more than uh, they trust that second group. Running back's an exception. It looks like edge yeah. is going to be an exception, but I, well, I just don't think you're going to see a whole lot of rotating unless you know some, some of those backups really step up in practice. Well, and, and it's not unusual at all in the offensive line. I mean, it was always my, I, I, yeah. I had five guys. You don't alternate guys out on the offensive line because they got to work together as a unit and they were working together as a unit. And again, you know, the lack of success in the run game, we didn't really emphasize it. We didn't, you know, we only saw one time the signature play I remember from watching the Kent State offense was a was a was a misdirection counter where they pulled both of the guards going back the other way. And we only ran that one time that I saw. And when we ran it, it worked and we got seven or eight yards on it. Um, so I don't think that Lewis was calling his run game. Um the way that we that it's built into that offense that, that that it can use, so I don't think he was emphasizing it. Uh, so I don't, I'm not too discouraged about that. I'm 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 frankly fine with that because he he didn't make it the, the focus of his offense. But um, you're not going to see the only time you really um, are going to see change on the offensive line is if somebody gets hurt or somebody's not getting the job done. If somebody's getting beat repeatedly, you take them out. So nobody was getting re beat repeatedly, so we didn't see any reason to substitute on the offensive line. I actually like it when all five guys play all five snaps, because that tells me that Bill O'Boyle is comfortable with those guys and they're getting the job done. Okay. Defensive line surprised me a little bit. Um, insofar as like a lot of guys didn't see very much playing time on the defensive line. So Shane Cokes played a whole game and, and um, I'm not uh, who, who got the mass of the snaps beside him in there. I know McClendon was in the whole game. McClendon played 50 snaps. Amari McNeil played 18. Uh, Chaz Wallace played 18 snaps. Shane Cokes played 59. Yeah. Uh, and then I don't think Bishop don't... Thomas only played nine defensive snaps. Yeah, Taj Alston Leonard... played 23. And Leonard Payne, 56. Yeah. So Leonard, Leonard Payne played. Payne and Taj Alston and Cokes played a lot in there. And so I was a little surprised that we didn't see more of Bishop Thomas and what have you. And I don't know what that, you know, I'm not going to try to read the mind of Sal and I, I know when I was coaching defensive line, you know, I, I stayed with the guys who were getting things done. And sometimes you, you get a little, you know, you get a little desperation. You're trying to put fit guys in there. But uh, I suspect that's, that Sanceri was satisfied with what he was getting from the guys that he had in there. And, you know, people may think that's it doesn't make sense given how much we gave up on offense. But the other thing about defense, too, is that everybody assumes if there's a lot of running game from the opponent team it's because of the defensive line, but that's not necessarily true. You know, I, I I haven't studied this film enough to say one way or the other, but but giving up a lot in the running game could be a lot – could could be the linebackers not getting fits and getting in the right places either. That being said, I was very gratified – Maybe maybe I shouldn't be, but – I was very gratified that two of the defensive stars on Saturday were the two guys from last year. Marvin Ham was one of the leading tacklers, and and um, Woods obviously with his interception and his play that 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 made me feel real good. All right, let's jump into the mailbag here. Buff to JD asked, "Who or what, if anything, was the biggest surprise to you about the Buffs' performance on Saturday?" I was very impressed by their composure in the face of adversity. A great sign for this team going forward. Biggest surprise. Wow. Well, I, I expected Dylan Edwards to make one of those big plays. I didn't expect him to make four of them. I guess well, it was a little bit of a surprise. And it was interesting because people, you know, I know people were saying, I think we even mentioned in one of our podcasts was Dylan Edwards keeps doing that to our defense. Does that mean our defense has a problem? Well, no, as it turns out, that's who he, that's who he is and that's what he does is those long plays. I mean, I, I think I, I'm not surprised by any of the positive things because I think I saw all that coming, to be honest. I'm not trying to, you know, look like Mr. Genius here, but I think I already mentioned the one surprising thing to me was that there was not more of a pass rush. Um, aside from that, I don't think anything really surprised me that we did. I, I man, I just had, I just had it a feeling in my gut that that offense was going to be like that. You know, you look at all those wider, it's not like you got to be a genius to look at that wide receiver room and not see this coming. And it was very clear to me from watching Shadur last year. And I know a lot of people, oh, well, that's the that that's the the swag level competition. So what, man? You know what? When a guy can stand back there in pressure and make the decisions and make the passes, he can do it. And it's not something mad, it's not some magical leap 
you know, to our level um, to, to stop that. So I was not surprised by a whole lot of that. I mean, again, just the, the lack of pass rush was a, was a big surprise to me, but nothing else really was. Kick- kickoffs as well. I, I was kind of expecting those to go in the end zone because we heard that, yeah. you know, Philly had really good leg strength in terms of the field goals. You'd think that would translate over, but uh, maybe they'll get that fixed. AZ History Buff 13 asked, is a hot dog a sandwich? This is a, a debate that was uh, all the rage about, what, five years ago? I have a very strong opinion on it. I'm willing to revisit it. it, it, It's clearly not a sandwich because a sandwich has two pieces of bread and a hot dog does not. So next. (laughs) Well, yeah, I say a hot dog is a hot dog and not a sandwich because if I told you, William, we're going to have a picnic next Saturday, I'm going to bring sandwiches. If I showed up with hot dogs, you'd be a little surprised, right? Right. Yeah, for sure. That's my reasoning. It's like a taco is not a sandwich because it's not two pieces. It's one thing bent in half. All right, we've gotten to the bottom of that. Let's see, WS Buff fan asked, how many of the problems on defense were talent deficiency versus scheme slash execution issues, especially on the front seven? William, you kind of touched on this yeah. a little bit. I, the talent is there for this to be a pretty salty defense at times. I I said going into the season, I think this is going to be a, a yo-yo type season in terms of the defense. There's a lot of talent, a lot of speed there that, some weeks is going to look better than others. And, uh, you know, I think TCU's offense is going to be pretty good this year. Chandler Morris is not Max Duggan, but he's a pretty darn good quarterback. And so uh, that, that was a good first test for this group. And they stepped up when they needed to, as we talked earlier. And uh, it's it's tough being a defensive coordinator, a defensive player in 2023. You know, the, the rules are tailored toward the offense. And one of those plays was Arden Walker's penalty. It's like, come on, yeah. Like, 20 years ago, thought, that's that's not a penalty. Right. That and I, you know, the wife and I again, you know, she she said that shouldn't have been a penalty. That it's not like he was trying to hit the guy. I was like, you know, I think that's a borderline. It probably shouldn't have been called, but I'm not gonna cry about it. You know, yeah. but I think the answer to the question is it's not a talent problem. I don't I don't I'm not gonna say we have the talent to be a top 20 defense in the nation because we don't. Okay, we clearly need more big guys. And I was thinking about this morning that, you know, everybody's going to write about how the way Prime is doing this and rebuilding the roster and and how well it's worked. And it's all true. But it's also very clear to me that that it was not as easy to stock the two lines as it was to stock all the uh, uh, skill positions. And I think in a private moment, Prime might agree with that too, because we, you know, we're still lacking – at the defensive line position and we're still lacking a little bit on the offensive line too. And, and I think it, I think it's pretty clear that it was tougher to fill those spots under the current circumstances. And I think that that will, I hopefully will be in the next off season will be uh, a priority, but I don't think we lack the talent to be a competitive defense. I thought we were a competitive defense and we stepped up when we needed to. And I, and I think a lot of it was more execution issues and also it was a, a, a dynamic offense uh, that we were facing. So I look for much better defensive days down the road, you know, and we may still have some days where they look like that, but um, we got some guys on that defense. Clearly, you know, look, we may have the best defensive player in the nation on this team. I don't think that's crazy to say that in Travis Hunter and, you know, Omar and Cooper on the other side of him was electric. I mean, he was, he was something special on Saturday and, any other any other day, what he and Trevor Woods did back in that secondary would have been the talk of, of the town, right? Um, or you know, on offense, Jimmy Horn Jr. His his day on Saturday would have been a big talk thing, but it was you know it, it's, it's overshadowed by some of the other guys. I think it's going to help us tremendously um, to get Juju Mitchell in there regularly at linebacker, to get Brendan Gant ready, to get uh, uh, Des Moines Kennedy maybe uh, more ready to go. And Brendan Gant, and so I think there's there's going to be a lot of room for improvement, and I think uh, sometimes it takes longer for a defense to gel than it does an offense. Yeah, one more question because I got to run here, William. The real Mizzou buff asked, "How does the win affect your season predictions? What's the floor slash ceiling for this team this year?" I said six and six before the season, but I picked them to lose the opener, so at the very least I'd have to go to seven. But no, I think. I would probably now change my prediction to eight and four, probably. Yeah, I, I think that um, 
from the start, I was thinking this was a team that could win eight games. I wasn't ready to make that prediction. I think I probably said six and six in our in our last podcast, something like that. Um, but what I take away from Saturday is we're not going to win 12. We're not going to go undefeated, okay? But there is no game on this schedule we can't win looking at it now and looking at how all those uh, all those teams performed in their week one there is no game that's out of reach so yeah. anything is possible this season based on what i saw saturday from this team and given the fact that i think we're going to make big improvement yeah i think the ceiling is is probably 10 wins because yeah. the pac-12 is salty this year it's a good right. conference and it's last year in existence that it's going to be a, a, a tough slate you know, I think it was, wasn't it the only undefeated conference through the first weekend. Now, Arizona right. State looked horrible, but the rest yeah. of the teams looked pretty good. Right. Yeah. You know, they had some easy games and some not so easy games. But I think, uh, yeah, I think that I think what we saw Saturday tells me that we can play with any team on our on our schedule. Now, we have enough depth and and, and I'll say it's size up front on both sides to to, to beat USC and, and Oregon. I don't know. We'll see. But uh I think we can hang with all those teams at this point and we'll see what happens. Well, I can't remember the last time we had that much fun doing a game recap podcast. William. Yeah. And there, I, there's yeah. so much more we could talk about. I wish I, I didn't have to run here, but uh, yeah, this is uh, different. This is fun. And uh, I can't even imagine what Saturday at Folsom field, the, the atmosphere is going to be like as coach prime runs out behind Ralphie yeah. for the first time crazy and, and given the given the opponent and, and it, i think and given the first week it's going to be pretty electric and crazy awesome well i know you have a lot of work to get done there as well william thanks as always for taking time out of your schedule to do this podcast and as always appreciate everybody out there for thank you adam thank you